come out about 75 German officers with their hands stuck up in the air, you know, and here come, come enlisting men from every direction. And they've come there where that lieutenant was just as white as a sheet. 30, about 31 of us boys, and that many Germans just come from every direction with guns, you know, hand them to <laughs> They thought we had them surrounded. They didn't think anybody just crazy enough 30 men to ride right up among all them German, them big old 45 pill boxes where you couldn't have knocked out with a artillery piece, you know, and just ride up there and open like ducks, you know, and ride right up to the barracks, stop. I didn't know that anybody had better sense than that. And then people talk about how we licked the Germans. Like I said, we got them so confused, they quit. We never did lick them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I could tell by his letters that, that the war was, in a way, changing him and changing his ideas and hurting his faith. Because before he went over, he was, he seemed, you know, to really have a, a profound faith and a belief in God. But all the things that he saw there, the suffering of, especially of children, that seemed to, to really get to him. You can, you can cut a TV off if the film gets too rough, but over there on the front lines, you don't cut it off. It's right there and you in it. There ain't no such thing as flipping a little button and walking in the other room and getting you a sandwich and a good drink. You were there and you ain't no way of getting out. We got over there, and when we got in there where the Germans had all these places where they burnt them Jews, I saw carload after carload of men and women, mostly women and old men and little children. They would put about a foot of unslacked lime. You know, you take water and put it in unslacked lime, it'll heat and heat set on fire and burn, and it gets hot. And they'd put these people in there in that lime, and just many as they could stand up. And they had what they call 40 of eights. It's supposed to hold 40 men or eight cows. Maybe they'd stack 100 in there, just like sardines, just take their gun butts and beat them in there and them with kids in their arms and that lime and then shut the door. And then they'd go to sweating. And the sweat would make that fire go to, that lime go to catching on fire and it'd burn the meat off the bones and them were screaming, you know, and they're dying like that. You know them people had never done nothing to the Germans. And just see them standing in that lime, meat burn off up to their knees and them were screaming and dying, locked up in there, and nobody to let them out, nor this, that, and the other. And then when you let them out, have somebody half burn up, grab you around the legs and kiss your shoes. We've never went through nothing like that in this country. And if you can go through something like that or come out and not be changed, you're gonna have to, you're gonna, you're gonna be different to what I always was. farms come in here and they come as commercializing raising chickens. People come as moving off of the farms, off of the farms and going to the cities, you know, to get jobs in mills and things because it wasn't as hard to labor and they had more money to spend and it just made all together a change. All, all in my lifetime I've seen it just turn right around from one way to go back the other. And I saw it turn from horses to tractors, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if I don't see it turn back to horses. There's not one half the cleared land in Wilkes County now as it was when I was a boy. And 10 times as many people, 20 times as many people living in it. There's 20 times the homes that there was when I was a boy. And just about one third the cleared land as it was back then. See, people lived off the land. They didn't have all the public jobs, and now they just got a place big enough for a yard and a house, and then the fields grow up. But I don't know what's the difference in having what you get by raiding it on the land and working money out and scrubbing yourself to death in the factory to buy what you have to have. I'd rather, I'd rather work outside as inside, so I'd rather raise it as to beat my brains out of trying to get it out of the factory. 
meet in the cupboard and the hide in the churn. Meet in the cupboard and the hide in the churn. Meet in the cupboard and the hide in the churn. If that ain't good stuff, I'll be darn groundhog. Yonder come sow with a smile and a grin. Yonder come sow with a smile and a grin. Yonder come sow with a smile and a grin. Groundhog gravy all over her chin. Groundhog. Father, we thank you for another wonderful day. Thank you for ever blessing. Thank you for this food. Bless it. We might eat and nourish our body. We might use our strength to glorify thee. Pass it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. What do you want, girl? Hmm? You want something to eat? I remember one time when Carol was a few months old, there was a real bad electric storm and we were just sitting down to eat and the lightning ran in and bursted the bulb over the table. And after that, she was real scared of storms. And uh, one evening, a cloud came up and it began to thunder and lightning and she began to be frightened, you know, and he came in from the orchard where he was working and took her in his arms and walked out up in the orchard as the storm came up. After that, she was not afraid of him. Head dicker, eye winker, tummy tinker, nose dropper, mouth eater, chin chopper, goody pupper. <laughs> you like that? Say it again. Oh, head dicker, eye, not nose dropper, mouth eater, chin chopper, goody pupper. <laughs> <laughs> You gonna play it on Grandpa? You gonna play it on Grandpa? Headache. Go ahead. It's all over now, Grandma. She done had that two or three times up and up. Up the hill about three. Good, right there. Okay, give me a steak. I'd rather get out here and dig ditches, work on a truck. Any kind of work outside. Any kind. It don't make no difference. Hacking lumber, sawmilling, or cutting timber. Or... Why, if I hadn't had pressure on me, a man couldn't have forced me into no garage working in Greece and oil and stuff, because I've always despised the smell of gas and motor oil and stuff like that. That's one job that I used to swear that I wouldn't have. Nobody couldn't give it to me, and took it and worked that 14 years. I always loved the farm. I just never did get financially able to even start thinking about a farm. Land come us jumping in price and jumping in price, and I found this place right here. Now, when Blanche went into the flower shop business, if she hadn't have got sick, why, I'd have probably turned loose and went into it, but I was working until she got to business, and she got to business up to work. It was making pretty good when she come down sick and had to quit, you see. She just had to quit and sell out. And uh, that stopped that, and I don't know, just just one thing right after another, and well, even a working over under on the, in the garage, I run a truck over a bank and broke my back. In 1965, my wife was running the flower shop and she kept having dizzy spells. And she went to a family doctor regular and she went to him and he examined her and he said, I can't believe what I found. He said, I want you to run more checks and get other people's and other doctors' ideas about this. So he run cardigams and things on her, and he told her, he said, you got just a little bit of fiber for a heart. And she had ensophemia, and her body gathered fluid. She had to take fluid pills all the time. And uh, she, he told her she had complete cardiac failure. 
and he put her on 10 hours of bed rest at night and 10 hour, uh, three hours in the middle of the day. He said, I don't mean lay down on a couch or something and watch TV, I mean go to bed. Well, my children are all in college, and she wouldn't let them know how bad she was. Of course, they knew, but she didn't want me to say nothing to them, afraid they'd quit school, and she wanted them all to have a college education. And this doctor had told her, she told him that she couldn't die until she got her kids through college, and he said, you better do some praying. Well, he didn't say too much about what he was feeling, but it was, uh, it was visible. I mean, he, his health seemed to go down, and of course, he, he did have some problems he had hemorrhoids and then later high blood pressure and uh, I'm sure that he was real discouraged although he didn't he didn't say too much about it but you could tell it was there and uh, it seemed that he began to age a lot faster than uh, than he should have and so we just um, there's just no way to describe how you go from day to day in something like that except just to say that you you just accept it and you live with it and uh, make the best of it. I'd quit going to church because I didn't see nothing in them. I told my wife, I said, if you go to church and you hear a man preach and you come out mad, you better off stay at home and you ought to go to church. I said, none of them believe in God. I said, they preach it, but they don't believe it. And I don't know. I always believed he was a God, but I'd been taught that he was far off. He died 2,000 years ago, and he'd come back someday and blow a trumpet and pick me up and take me to heaven, maybe, if I was good enough to pass the test. And that was as far as my God went. And then one weekend, all the children were home from school, and Carol ran everybody out of bed that morning and told them they were going to church with Mama, and so we all went to church. And this morning, when I walked into the sanctuary, there was a joy like nothing I'd ever felt in my whole life that just seemed to envelop me. And it was such a joy that I couldn't keep the tears from flowing. And just a singing, beautiful, joy like nothing I had ever felt. We got over there and this little preacher got up and he said, Lord promised me a miracle. He said, who believes in miracles? And two or three of us raised our hands and I guess there's about 80 or 90 in the church and two or three of us raised our hands. So he got up and preached and I didn't, couldn't tell you today one word he preached. But I thought when he was preaching, now he's preaching to my brother and he's going to get him to go up and rededicate his life. And uh, when he stood up and gave the altar call, here went my brother, he walked right up beside of me, but before my brother started up there, there's something inside of me went around and said, wish, 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 wish. And it kept getting faster, and every time I went around, it was hot. It felt like a coal of fire about the side of your hand going around inside of my, me. And <coughs> when we was kids, we used to go to molasses makings, and we'd take a rag and soak it in kerosene oil. Everybody had kerosene lanterns. And we'd soak this rag and kerosene oil and tie it on them a stick and light it and sling it around and around, you know, and he'd say it'd make a wishing sound. We'd say we was making a ribbon of fire and you could sling it fast enough, it'd look like a ribbon of fire, you know. And that's what I thought of. But it was, I got to boiling, and there's an old school teacher that taught me and all three of my children stand in front of me. And I was gripping the back of the pew and I thought if I opened my mouth, the steam would boil out and it'd scald her to death. And I was gritting my teeth and I thought the steam was coming out of my eyes, my ears, and my nose. And when my brother and his wife walked by, they looked like it was about 18 inches high, and I was looking at them through a big fog. And I couldn't understand why my wife wasn't concerned because I was a-boiling. And all at once, I knew she was going. I think, what's she going for? She's ready to die. And the doctor told her she couldn't live another month, hardly. I said, she come home and said he wasn't expecting to see her again because he just told her to come back in four weeks, and he wouldn't give her, I mean, six weeks instead of four, and he wouldn't give her a month to live. And she said, he's not expecting to see me no more. And uh, I think, what's she going to the altar for? And when she got about halfway up there, the thought hit me, you touch that preacher, you're going to melt and run across the floor like butter. And I said, Lord, there ain't no way I can't get up there. I don't have the strength to get there. And the next thing I knew, I was there with my wife. And the preacher put one hand on my shoulder and one hand on her shoulder, and we knelt down. And just about the time my knees hit the floor, all this heat left me. I just got up and walked back to my seat. I didn't go up there for nothing to keep them, except keep them melting. As we knelt, I felt just something happen, it seemed like in the back of my head, in the base of my skull. And it was like an, I thought, like an electric shock, because I'd been shocked pretty bad one time before, and I knew, you know, the similarity was sort of the same feeling. And that just seemed to spread through my body. And, of course, the 
thought that flashed through my mind was that I was having a heart attack. But I was so happy it didn't make any difference, you know. <laughs> and when I got back to my seat, my wife came back. My oldest daughter grabbed her and started crying, and that was unusual for her to cry in front of anybody. And uh, so we got about halfway home. I wasn't talking. I was studying about this heat. I wasn't interested in nothing else was going on around me. I'd felt something. God had come alive, and I knew he had power over me to make me go up in a little puff of smoke or just do away with me. Instead of being a God that died 2,000 years ago, he was here now, and he had power over me, and I knew it. And we started home and got about halfway home. Carol looked over to her mother, and she said, you think the Lord healed your heart, don't you? She said, I know he did. And she come home and she tied seven different kinds of medicine up in a plastic bag and sat in the middle of the table and says, I am healed. Well, he didn't heal the encephemia now, he healed her heart. And on the following Wednesday, one week or 10 days later, we went over there to prayer meet and the preacher wasn't there. And uh, she still couldn't lay down. She'd sat up and, and propped up on seven or eight pillars all these years, you know, and she couldn't lay flat in the bed. And uh, so, we went over there to this prayer meeting, and they asked me to dismiss the service. And when I was a praying, as soon as I got through, she said, let's go. And we took out. And I said, what's the matter? Didn't you like my prayer? And she said, I've got to get home, honey. She said, I'm so sick, I feel like I'm going to die. Well, I knew she hadn't took no medicine in 10 days, and the doctor had told her not to do without that medicine at all, to have it at all times. And I felt a repulse, and her heart was good and strong. And she said, it's not my heart said, I'm sick. And I brought her home, and she wandered up near the commode full of old blue pu old pus like comes out of a boil or a sore, you know, that's infected. And she just almost fell a commode, and it stunk like a dead horse. And I finally got her to the bedroom, and a little bit, I went back in there and checked her, and I was in the living room praying. And I felt the presence of the Lord in that room, the Spirit of the Lord just almost picked me off the couch. I was laying on the couch. And a little bit, she called me and said, come in here. And I walked in there, and she said, take these pillows out of my head and let me lay flat on the bed. Just leave one. She had seven stacked up and was sitting up against them. I took them out and laid her down flat. She had two foam pads she'd put on her legs that swelled so bad, and she'd been sleeping in a, that's like in a hammock with her feet on them two thick foam pads and on these pillows for six and a half years. She said, take them out and lay my legs flat on the bed. And I did, and she laid there a minute too, and I said, you all right? And she said, I feel great. And we spent the summer uh, crying and praying and seeking God and going to, to services and sharing what um, had happened in our lives. And of course, there were a few who received it and there were many who didn't. But it didn't change the fact that it was real and it still is. And many times, uh, Frel, especially when he'd have the visions that he's talked about, he would cry and look at me and say, Honey, am I losing my mind? And why is all this happening to me? I say, Why? Hasn't it happened to some of those people who've been church members all their life and, and who uh, have been good people? I just never could seem to quite understand why God chose to move and work in him this way. But to me, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. But if I hadn't really known, surely that it was God, I would have been afraid. One night after the Lord healed Blanche was out here at the house, sitting in a chair out there, and a whole bunch of them, we was praying for one another. And somebody would sit in a chair and say, I'm so-and-so, somebody they knew it was sick enough, you know, and I was praying for them. They were sitting by proxy, as they called it, and we were praying for them. And some of them come over and just put their hand on me and said, let's pray for Frail. I said, what are you going to pray for? And I said, I'll get closer to the Lord. And next thing I knew, I was up somewhere up in the air looking down at them, and all of them, I could see me sitting there, and all of them with their hands around on it. And it didn't seem too strange to me, you know. I didn't think too strange about it. But I don't remember coming out of my body, and I don't remember going back in it. But next thing you know, I was there in my body. Well, a little while after then, I went out on the hill out there, and I got out and started praying one morning. I just woke up, and I was full of the spirit. I couldn't tell when I had anything in my hand. I went to eat breakfast. I couldn't tell when I had the fork in my hand or anything. And I told Blanche, I said, call my boss and tell him I won't be in this morning. I said, I couldn't do nothing. But I go out. I don't know where I could drive over or not. I went out there on the hill and got down under a poplar tree and started praying. And all at once, I just come out of my body and I come out of the back of my head then. And I felt like I went up in the air until I looked like I was a 
One of these, you've ever seen these old, what they used to call Cupid dolls dressed in overalls? But I was up in the air and I was so high that I looked down and I saw myself there with coveralls on down under this tree, down on my knees. When I, the thought hit me, now what will Blanche say when she comes out here and finds me and I'm not there? I thought she'd find my body, but I wouldn't be there. And I felt like it, I just held up there in the air and I'd come down like I was going back and then I'd go up higher. And I'd come down like I was coming back and then I'd go up higher and just got on till I couldn't see my body. And then I slowly come back down and went in the back of my neck. Paul said, let's lay aside the principles of the doctors of Christ. Let's go on into perfection. Glory to God. And this is the hour that the nature of Jesus has been implanted in his brothers. Because that's the only way that we can have the truth of God is to eat his flesh and drink his blood. If you don't do it, you're not going to have any life in you. Glory to God. And the Bible said when they came out of Egypt, there was not a feeble one among them, glory to God. And I want you to know that as we eat his flesh and drink his blood, there'll not be a feeble one among us. There won't be any more prayer lines anymore. Glory to God. If you know God for yourself, you don't have to have another man to pray for you. Hallelujah. He's not a far off God. He's a very present God. He's a closer than even our brother that sits beside us because he's in us. But stop preachers right in the middle of the sermon, go into strange churches. The Lord would say, go. And when I got there, right in the middle of the sermon, he'd say, get up and stop the preacher and testify. And I'd get up and stop him. People would say, you get thrown out on your head. My wife used to tell me, you're going to get thrown out on your head. I said, me and the Lord's the majority in any crowd. I'm not afraid. And I wasn't because I was obeying the Lord. Praise God forevermore. Praise the Lord. Come on. Brother Pierce said there was a time of trouble ahead, not for God's people. There's no time of trouble for God's people except one thing, and that is fear of the unknown. We've got to enter into a spiritual realm that this flesh has never walked in before. That's the reason he said, them will become son to God that's bled by the Spirit, because we'll go anywhere if we're following that Spirit. It wants to take us. And if we're following man or flesh, we're going to back down when we get to going into this spiritual realm. God has showed me that everything that we've been preached has just been stepping stones to get to get to where we can enter into this spiritual realm. All this stuff that we've been preached will be so obsolete in a year from now, we won't even listen at it no more. We'll think how foolish I was a year ago because we're going to go somewhere that Peter started when he started walking on that water and his faith failed him. Now let us pray. Jesus, when he met the woman at the well, he, he didn't condemn her and tell her she couldn't enter the kingdom of heaven. She was living in sin or anything of the kind. But she had enough faith that he was God until she was filled with the Spirit. God is trying to show us that he's not so interested in what this flesh does. He's wanting to get that Spirit back centered to him, you see. That was a part he breathed into man to make him a living soul. As far as God's concerned, the rest of man is just the same as me going out here plowing dirt. I use dirt to grow my stuff, but what does the dirt mean to me? The corn I'm growing is what I'm after, and that's the way God is. But man, it's what the mind is centered on, the heart's centered on, what the soul's after. That's, that's what he's perfecting. This um, came to me one morning as I was waking up. It, as I was waking up, it seemed like that just all kind of shapes and forms were kind of spinning around in my mind. And as I came fully awake, they just formed a pattern, and it was this. And uh, it just stayed on my mind. I got up and got breakfast and started, after breakfast, started doing the dishes, and I kept, I just couldn't get the picture out of my mind. So I got a pencil and uh, some graph paper and, and sat down and drew the pattern. And as I was drawing it, I realized that it was, to me anyway, it seemed to be a quilt pattern. And the words the woman at the well just kept going through my mind. So I thought, well, it, that must be, it's a quilt pattern, and that's the name it's supposed to have. That it's Christ, the center, the well of living water. And uh, some have explained it different ways with uh, the colors and the numbers being uh, symbols of different things. But I really, as far as, uh, as a revelation for me on the meaning of it, I don't have. To me, it's, it's still just the square and the, uh, a quilt square and and that's the name. I, 
it came from somewhere, and I like to think it uh, it was from the Holy Spirit. What's I tell you? I told it on you a few times. <laughs> I told it the night she got married, she had two dollars. I mean, and that night after we got married, we got married, she had two dollars. She went and wanted her mama to keep it for her. And mama said, well, why won't you keep it? She said, you think I'm gonna sleep with a strange man with two dollars in my pocket? He might get. <laughs> I didn't even have two dollars. I spent it all. <laughs> well, I didn't say you did. I said I told it on you. <laughs> the one thing about it, she couldn't have married me for my money because I didn't have none left when we got through getting married. I was making all of twenty-one dollars a month. You had seven dollars after, after we got married. That's what she told me. You had seven dollars. Yeah, and then we we uh, bought a bus ticket for the two of us up here to visit your relatives. And um, we walked everywhere we went up here. Walked from Moravian, we rode a bus. Oh, it was so hot that day. And uh, we walked from Moravian, rode a bus from town out to Moravian, and walked from there to Gop Town. And I can still hear that water in Cub Creek down there that runs alongside the road. It wasn't paved then, it was a dirt road. And uh, there I was with my good shoes, and I didn't know I was going to have to walk that far. And we was walking up there, and that water was running down. It sounded so cool and so good. I wanted to go down there and wade in it. But think? we kept walking. <laughs> we just had to keep on we walk, walking. <laughs> we, we walked about two mile and a half. And I was used to making 10, 15 mile hikes. I didn't seem like yeah, no but I was. All I was used to do was hiking back and forth well, the you, made out, <laughs> <laughs> you made out to me like you just able to do anything anybody else was. No, I was. I did it, didn't I? <laughs> I know what you grumbled about there. <laughs> no, I was just talking about I could, The thing that, that I remember so is the sound of that water and how cool it sounded. The day was so hot and that water sounded so cool and good. So I was happy. I didn't mind the walk. I just, I, I'd have walked it if I didn't. Well, I'd have cared if you'd have just said you was tired. Well, why didn't I know that? <laughs>